use. There we go. Uh, you should try the internet. Maybe they have some other pictures. All right. So yesterday we were talking, we left off talking about the different type of, of shafts and how that incorporated the propellers. And we left off with spline shaft. And uh, it often includes a master spline, which is two splines missing in a valley. And then I don't have a picture of it, but what coincides with aforementioned master spline is that the uh, the hub that's going to actually go on the the taper uh, the sorry taper is the taper the hub that's going to go on here has uh, a slot where this will actually go into. So you can't misindex the hub and therefore misindex the prop. So the prop's always going to go on the right way. And as I've been taught to say, is never say idiot proof because they will always make a better idiot. Hey, Kevin. But yeah, idiot, idiot resistance. Because I'm sure there's somebody who'd either grind a spline in there or remove the little screw. Yeah. Uh, can you go? Can you explain again the propeller when? when you place it horizontally and then have to go move one ball back? Oh yeah, so under most circumstances, you would put the propeller on the airplane. Pen. You'll put the, the engine at top dead center. And I always, I just say top dead center number one, which if you put it on top dead center number one, then you can verify that all the timing marks and everything are straight. So this, just ignore the prop here. Let's pretend like the prop's not there. So you, what you're gonna do is you're gonna put the prop, so put the engine top dead center of number one, then put the prop on horizontal, then take it off and go one more bolt hole in the direction of rotation. So now it's gonna be sitting here. And that's the correct spot for it to be sitting at top dead center on a four cylinder engine. And wh why do we place it horizontally? Just It's the easiest way to describe it. Put uh, it on horizontal and then one bolt hole in direction of rotation. Or I could just say, here's a clock. This is about two o'clock and this is eight o'clock, two and eight. With those, <laughs> yeah. And so I could just say, I'll just put it on a two and eight when facing the, the front of the airplane. Same thing. It's just, Wait, uh, so I you... like the... Go ahead. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Do you do this, you said, for easier, like, uh, hand propping? Well, I believe that's where it all came about. So any, any like, Cub or Chief or one of these little planes that has no starter and an A65, it's absolutely where it has to be. And so I believe that that all came about from hand propping, and so it just became the standard of where it goes. Uh, any place else, and you have a really hard time trying to hand prop it. But... Uh, there are radial engines out there we have to hand prop, and while that doesn't, they're not indexed that way at all. I had a question. Um, so at work a while ago, we placed a three-blade prop on aircraft, and we were told huh? that um, it always has to be upright, the third blade, so two at the bottom and one always um, in the middle. Yeah, that's how three blades stop. So a three blade, they almost always stop in this direction. Right. Mm -hmm. And I believe that one is the reason why is because the ground clearance is the most this way. So I don't know, it's just the way they do it. Like, you know, if, the, if there's an accident, less chance of damaging a blade. Okay. But follow the directions, follow the manufacturer directions. And remember, like I said yesterday, it's the airframe manufacturer. that's going to tell you where to do it. It's not the prop manufacturer doesn't tell you where to index it. So install it index it per the airframe manufacturer and torque it per the prop manufacturer. All right, three, um, this is something that, oh, it's not really out there very often, but I just saw mention it to inspect. So you're always actually supposed to inspect splines, MSPs, inspect spline wear. Spline wear with a spline, with a spline. Go slash no go gauge. I've never even seen one of these things. I would have to send it off to somebody who had one, but you are actually supposed to, to check it with that. Um, and that would be inspect spline wear, inspect 
inspect both shaft and hub. So just so you know that they don't last forever. Eventually they start wearing out. And if they're treated well, then they probably will last for a lifetime. All right, the next one, I think there's some Q&A questions about this. So you really have to kind of pay attention on this one. And a lot of people get confused on this. I'm gonna to try to make it not confusing. It's a little hard because we don't have one to look at right here. So the installation, the installation of this type of a spline shaft uses front and rear cones to center the prop on the shaft. So installation uses front and rear cones, rear cones to center the prop on the shaft. So you center the prop on the shaft. All right, I'm gonna pull over a, let me see, what else do I have here that might help us? Oh yeah, I got a cool video for today. So something to look forward to. We'll start here. Okay, so we're talking about this type of shaft. And with this type of shaft, it is not tapered. It's like the taper shaft and you put that adapter on. Well, number one, you have the keyway right there, which, which keeps it from rotating on the shaft. But because the shaft is tapered and the hub is tapered, it just goes on until the taper meets the taper and then it doesn't go any further. Well, these shafts right here, these uh, spline shafts, they're straight all the way down. And so if you stop and think about it, you think, okay, wait a minute. So if I tighten the nut up on here, what's really stopping the whole hub from going further down the shaft? Is it just that the spline hits the spline and all the spline smash together? And actually the answer to this is no, that is not a good idea. So let's check, let me check my next segments PowerPoint. I think I've got something that might help us out here. Um, adjustable props, I think so. Let's see, let's see, let's see. No, not really, no. All right, so back to this one. All right, so what actually is, um, yeah, I'll do this one. So here's, here's what the hub looks like. Oops. So I don't have a really good, um, I don't know why I've drawn it already, but anyway, um, the hub looks similar to the taper one with this big nut right here but it works differently than, than that. Um, not a whole lot different. You still have this big nut. The big nut actually is the thing that screws it down and the big nut's also the thing that pulls it back off. So, you know, it's just like the taper crank, but because you don't have the taper, you have to have some way for this cone to actually sit down and be centered on the shaft. So let me pull this one up. All right, so this is a representation of that. So you have these cones, and so I want you to get your bearings on here. So this is the shaft right here, the propeller shaft. I mean, it says it, but I want you to, I'm gonna point it out so you can kind of get the idea here. So here we have the, the prop shaft. All of this right here is the prop shaft. All right, and then I'm gonna go back to this laser pointer. All right, so here's the thrust nut. and you haven't been, you haven't seen a thrust nut yet because the kind of engines that we've been working on don't have a thrust nut, but thrust nuts are something that are used on uh, radial engines and engines with these taper or taper spline shafts because they have gigantic roller bearings as thrust bearings. And so the, the roller bearing goes in there and then this big nut, it doesn't look like a nut because it's smooth, but it's not really, is tightened down against the thrust nut. And so you have this big uh, surface out here. Well, Okay, so here's this whole part right here is the hub and you can only see part of it. And so what they're saying is you have to have this rear cone that goes in there. And remember it's in three dimensions. So it's gonna be like a, like a ring that goes on your finger, right? It's this ring that slides all the way down on there but it's tapered at one side. And then on the front end of it, the, um, yeah, the front end. So now we're, we're kind of looking over here at a different section. Um, this is that big retaining nut that I told you screws down and it also acts as a puller. All right, so this 
is got the same thing. It's got another cone that slides down over it. So the, this black cone here and this black cone here, they're, they're just two pieces, like a big ring that goes on it. And you have to center them correctly or they have to make sure they're the right size. So what they're representing on this side over here is a misalignment. Let me get rid of all the ink on there. A misalignment. And the reason why is because this hub is not actually hitting the tapered part. It's missing it. It's missing it and it's making contact in the wrong spot. That's bad, all right? And so you don't want that. And then let me see, on this one, um, they're showing something else that's bad. And that's as you've tightened this nut and brought this all together, this cone has actually started to hit the splines and that's not good. So you're tightening up the nut against the splines, which could allow the, um, this hub to slide back and forth between the two cones. So you, gotta, you have to understand this cone issue. And it's really, I mean, it's all the pictures I really have on this. Unfortunately, it's kind of such an old thing that there's not a lot of uh, useful pictures, but let's see if we can kind of work through it. And I normally have a, 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 at least a ring I'll show you guys, but um, let me see. Um, a lot of it's the same way. So installation uses front and rear cones to send the prop on the shaft. Yeah, I said that. So one, we use, use Prussian blue. That's Steve's favorite stuff. Use Prussian blue to verify, to verify 70% contact area. And it's easy to remember because it's the same thing as we had on the taper shaft of 70%. And 70% is passing grade for aviation. So, all right. Uh, rear, co rear cone bottoming, rear cone bottoming is common and must be corrected. Rear cone bottoming is common. It must be corrected, corrected, um, so that's here. And then front cone, front cone bottoming may happen if cone hits spline, if cone hits the splines before before it hits the hub or prop hub, prop hub. There we go. So if this happens, if this happens, move the rear cone forward, move rear cone forward. Uh, okay, let me go back to my slide here. So you put Prussian blue on this black part right here. And you put Prussian blue on this part over here. And so you put the cone, you know, so yeah, you put the rear cone on, which is a big ring. You slide it down the shaft and you put it on. Then you put on the hub, which has the prop blades on it. Then you put on the front cone and then you tighten the, the thrust nut, or here's not the engine thrust nut, but the retaining nut, I should say. So tighten the retaining nut. Then you're gonna take it off and we're gonna take a look at this. And what am I gonna see? I'm gonna see all the pressure and blue that I put right here did not make contact with the hub. And I could put pressure and blue on here, but if I put it all the way across, I would say, okay, well, it's touching the front of the hub, but it's also touching my splines, which is really bad. So in order to correct this, what I would have to do is actually take off a little bit and modify or um, take off a little bit of this, this front, the cone piece right here to get rid of that lip where it's interfering so that the hub comes back and touches all the black. Okay, that would solve that problem. Two, I've got to put shims back here and move this hub forward. And why do I have to move it forward? Because I need more space here. So I shim this, move the whole hub this cone forward, which means that when I tighten down the retaining nut, this cone here will tighten up into the hub and not touch the spline right there, giving me a little bit of clearance right there. And so the whole thing is then pushed 
here against here against here and pushed against here and pushed against the thrust nut. And so that's the way it should be. So nothing should be pushed up against the splines. So, and it's about the best I can do, except for, um, yeah, if I had access to the classroom, I could do a little video with one of ours and show you, but I don't, so I can't. Yeah, I cannot picture this at all. Um, I know, and I, and I have such a hard, it's the best drawing I have. I just don't know what else I have here. Let me take a look. Um, just try Google, let's see here. Almost like a tire balancing machine, like when you set up the tire with the spacers. You're absolutely, yeah, actually, that's totally accurate. Um, try to prop. Um, well, unfortunately, I'm gonna get all kinds of stuff for boats is what I got. Okay. Let you see what I'm looking at. I wonder what that is. No, that's not going to help. There. What is that one? <laughs> it's another, another of the same thing but it's all at least in one picture. I didn't know. Nope. No, I don't got anything for you good. Or well, they don't anyway. Let's see. The inner webs is not going to be helpful today. Ooh, that's what I was looking for. Nope. Hey, Kevin, are these PowerPoints uh, online? Um, maybe. Sometimes I put them there. No, I don't have anything useful we can share with you. Other than just reiterating what I already said, and that doesn't help. There, that's what I wanted. Let's see. This is backwards um, from what we just looked at where the, where the front cones are on this side and the rear cones on this side. But this is the prop hub up here. This is the prop hub up here. And this is the shaft. And it's kind of weird to have the splines right there. Yeah, that makes sense. So splines there. So here's the rear cone. And I, and I think I'm really just saying the same thing over again, but maybe in one picture you can find it where you slide this cone on, then you slide on the hub, then you slide on another cone with the retaining nut, you tighten it all together. And where is it supposed to hit? It's supposed to hit right here, right here. And all of that pushes it against the thrust nut. And if it doesn't, then you have a problem. If this right here makes contact with the front of the splines, you've got a problem because you've tightened this big nut up against this, against the spline, and you did not want to do that. So there's no assurances that this is tight against here and this is tight against here. The only thing that you've assured yourself it's tight is this nut is tight against the ring and that cone is tight against the splines, and that is not good. There's supposed to be a small amount of space here before it touches the splines. And what would cause that? Just wear? No, um, just wrong sizing. It's just it's just one of those things you want to make sure that you um, put assemble it correctly. There's something else that's a little different along the same lines. 
So here's the cones, what they look like. I mean, I don't think it helps you a whole lot. And it'd be nice if this is actually wasn't blurry. But you have a cone. It's an open link. Let's try this. No, pretty much saying the same thing I did. Huh? No great pictures. Well, I tried. Can you zoom in on the top one? Um, well, I'm actually just looking at it in a web page. And it's just too blurry. So I've opened up the, the original web page here, and it's not any better. At least I don't think. Yeah, it's a little better. Hey, Kevin, if you yeah. go back to your PowerPoint one, can you explain like what the location and orientation of what the parts are like, which way, you know, does it spin and all that? Like, I feel like it'll be better. Okay, so let's take a look at this. This is a pretty good picture. So spline shaft, uh, cone spacer. So that is the one thing that's not being shown here. But uh, the cone spacer, if the spacer is not the right size, then that is gonna put the rear cone in the wrong position. If the rear cone is too far back, this front cone is gonna smash into the splines. See, the, the rear cone is actually, has a larger inside diameter, so it slides down all of the splines. It slides down all the splines and rests back in here, this rear cone does. And the front cone doesn't, it's not as big, and it only slides across here and it'll bump into where the splines are right here. So that's really bad if the nut smashes the front cone into the, into the front of these splines, then all you've done is tighten that cone up super tight against the splines. That doesn't do any good. That front cone's got to tighten up against the hub, which is part of the hub right here, um, and assure that you're tightening it all up. All right, so let me go back to- Question, Kevin. Yeah. Um, so say the well, precession blue is the only really way you would know if it's going to go on correctly then. Otherwise, if you just put it on, you wouldn't really know if it's hitting the spline. That's correct. So again, so this is the, the engine side over here. This is the front of the prop flange here. So um, the, the aircraft is headed ooh, to, my, to the right here. And um, so this is the front cone. These are the splines. So here you have the thrust nut. It, it does, it goes inside here just like that. It's the, kind of weird how it does that because this is it's sort of a two piece deal. Um, so when you tighten up this nut and this cone, if it hits that, then the nut is tight. This is tight against the splines and the hub is free to go back and forth, right and left. Just bang, 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 bang. And there's no assurances that it's tight. Would you feel that as play? Yeah. Yeah, you can. If, you, if you're a student enough mechanic that you were student enough to um, feel the play, but not enough to know what you were doing. So you could grab it and move it, but maybe it's a thousandth of an inch, but you're not gonna, it may move just a tiny bit, or you could run into this situation where you had the cone was just not quite the right size and was pinched right here. And so um, once this little spot wears out, you're going to have all this space and that prop's going to start moving back and forth. And you just so, put that, <clears throat> or you need 70% of contact on those cone faces with the hub. Yes. We could almost take this and... It doesn't have to be split. I mean, I don't know. They just did do the whole picture. And this kind of goes over here like that. And this all connects. It's like one big piece. I don't know why they made it two and cut it out in the middle. But you're just looking at the rear end here and the front end over here. So, so I'm sorry I don't have anything else I can really share with you on that one. Um, looks similar to the installation on a Huey rotor. It might be. That I don't know. It actually really helped when you said that the airplane was like going to the right. Okay. I was thinking about it up and down, but then when you said that, I was like, oh, well now I can piece it together. Yeah, I wish I had some good pictures. I just don't. I don't even have a video on how it's done. It's just something I should do. So failure, failure. 
failure to properly tighten hub to properly tighten tighten hub tighten hub can cause cone galling can cause cone galling which is going to lead to a loose prop and that's actually going to start galling the crankshaft and the splines and wear out the splines and that's okay just get a new crankshaft new prop hub i mean how much could that be right um, some of the uh, projects that you guys do in lab, you know me, and I always say it, I hate busy work. And boy, if you ever think I'm giving you something that's busy work, you let me know. And if I agree with you, it's the last time that it ever happened. But one of the things that, that I started doing is when you guys are going to work a ground adjustable propeller, and I'm going to make you adjust the blades on it. And I started this new thing, and I shouldn't, I, some people aren't always happy with me when I do this because, never mind. Um, but I make you take the prop off and on. And so there's this constant, yeah, we go, people go in the tour room asking for anti-seize. And so, you know, that goes over, but I have you do everything and I have you do it right. And, um, the reason why I have you take this prop off and on is because you get used to and learn how to take off a prop off of a taper, uh, off the, uh, spline shaft and you, then you can see the cones and you can experience it. Now I don't actually make you do the pressure blue. I probably should just for the fun of it. Um, in fact, I probably will start that. And uh, then you'll see how to do that. So have you tighten it all up and put it on and experience that. And then, then once you do it, you'll understand. It's just really hard here to explain it, but uh, you'll have to trust me that I will have you do it in lab. And when you do it, you're going to just have the pieces in your hand and going, Oh, I get it. Oh, why don't you just say that? So it'll, it'll make more sense to you. Yeah, why don't you show us a picture? What picture? I'm just kidding. That's what we're <laughs> going to say. <laughs> I don't have a picture. I looked. Um, okay, so let's move on to something that you will understand here without too much trouble. So that'd be 16.16. Check the tracking. You always want to check tracking. Check tracking after after installation. And that goes for any prop on any engine, on any, any style. Uh, it's more so important if you're working on a wood prop because the chances of you actually screwing a wood prop up are pretty good. So blade, I'll tell you what blade tracking. So blade tracking, blade tracking is ensuring that both blades is that both blades both blades track in the same plane in the same geometric plane balance plays a lot into that doesn't it nope balance has nothing to do with tracking So I'll show you this picture and then I'll make fun of past students. All right, so this is blade tracking and this is how it shows in your, in your book. I've never done this with a cowling fixture. One of the things you have to do is make sure the airplane doesn't move. If the airplane moves for, forward and backwards then the prop is gonna move forward and backwards. So the way they've set this particular one up is that they put a block of wood next, down here on the ground in front of the prop. I don't know about that one. Usually what we do is we take and put it underneath the propeller. And then as the propeller is here, I would mark it and then slowly rotate the prop through until the other blade comes around and then look and see where it is. And maybe it hit over here. And then you measure the difference between that and it can't be more than um, one, one sixteenth of an inch from metal. This is how I remember that from metal. But wood, wood, eh, you know, they're a little bit. Yeah, be a little more understanding. So wood is twice as much. So it's eighth inch for wood. Not, I'll write that in the notes a little bit. So you're allowed eighth inch for wood, and a sixteenth inch for metal props. Now, this is always the funny part because I will watch students because you have to do the, the tracking on the uh, the ground adjustable once you put it back on. And I will see students spend 20 or 30 minutes looking for wood that will fit this exact space right here. And before you know it, I'll see a, you know, a book and uh, a couple pieces of paper 
and then a couple of you know screwdrivers within a plate of wood and it's like this ridiculous kind of thing i want to remind you that we live in a three-dimension world and what i would do because i do it all the time is rather than spending the next half hour looking for a piece of wood let me go back to this one if i can do it you just get a chop saw just cut the blade off just put some wood and cut the blade until it works you don't always have to do it down here on the ground. You can actually do something down here. So what I would do is I would just go over the shop and I would grab a stool, just a stool. And I would set the stool up and I'd bring the prop around. I'd mark it on the stool where it went on one. I'd mark it on, came around on the other because you can do it anywhere out here. You know, get a taller stool, just move the prop up a little bit. So you can check tracking out here on the sides. It doesn't have to be checked right here on the very bottom. You know, it's just how you want to do it. So, you no, know, it's a bad picture. Well, of course, because I drew it. So, if I were doing it right here, I would set up some sort of stand where you know, maybe it was like right, right there. And then I could mark it right there. If my stand is a little bit taller, I just move the prop a little bit. I hope you followed that. But if not, go look for some wood. It's okay. But you've got to check the tracking. That is, that's the main point. However you do it, you've got to check it. And, oh, I'm over here. Um, so if, if the prop is bent or incorrectly installed, the blades will not touch the same spot. So if the prop is bent, maybe it's a wood prop and you didn't uh, torque it evenly in a, in a circle carefully down in small increments, and you just tighten the first bolt up to 300 inch pounds and the second one to 300, oh, it'll ruin the prop and you'll see it right there when you get into, track. it won't track, it'll be way out of, out of specs. So if the prop is bent, like one bait is, blade is bent because the owner's pulling on that blade when they pull another hanger or something, you'll see it. Um, or incorrectly installed. Installed, the blades will not touch the same spot, the blades will not touch the same spot. And that's a bad thing. Um, max allowable, max allowable out of track is one sixteenth inch for metal and one eighth inch for wood. Uh, tracking, I don't know about this one, but it's, it's what it is. Tracking can be corrected with shims. And there's a whole procedure for doing it. I'm not so much the shim kind of a guy to track for after tracking. If uh, I've got a prop that's not tracking correctly, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna send it to a prop shop and have it fixed. I think that's a much better fix than shimming it up. Where would you put the shims in the bolts? Uh, on the hub. Uh, so like yeah. So if it's a wood prop, they'll actually stick them. Um, let me see if I have a picture. There we go. Let's go. It seems like you need like graduated shims where the ones. You do. One side. Okay. So you would put like a, a, a shim that was, that was just not helpful. Thank you. Um, pen. So you'd have a sh like a paper shim that you would put just on this part of the, of the hub. And so if it were to push out this side and not this side, but to me, you're always going to have then a space here where nothing's touching. I don't like that. So that's what would happen. But, um, or down here, you would have a, you would see it sometimes a paper shim that would start here and just go around halfway around, halfway around. And then the bottom half would have nothing on it. And so you have to make sure you get the shim in the right spot. And that's why you have to always reference the blade, make sure that, you knew which blade, otherwise you're just gonna uh, make the problem twice as bad because you took the part that wasn't supposed to be shimmed and shimmed it and the part that was supposed to have shims and that didn't have shims, then you got problems. But 
think it's a wood prop and that's the problem. It's been smashed incorrectly. And so it's a little, little off sides. I just send it out to a prop shop and have them fix it. And which I makes could see how a really thin, um, uh, a really uh, thin piece at the hub would make a exaggerated uh, a difference at the prop tip. Yep. All right, so I'm going to spend a, a lot of today, I think, it's hard to say how long some of this takes, talking about installation issues, troubleshooting issues, because you think about it, this is the biggest moving part on, an, on the aircraft, and they do, they do cause problems. So you want to make sure that um, you're not creating problems and how to fix them. Sometimes the fix is really simple, but people don't stop and think about it. So vibration. Hey, Kevin. Yeah. Um, the prop shop, do they, do they recharge or how does that work? With recharge. Or I mean, oh, like money. on a wood prop, yeah. they have dimensions that we don't have. And that's the one thing that I really hate about props is the manuals for these things are really hard to come by, really expensive. And some of the prop some of the uh, manufacturers, I don't know, they're not so quick to, to get, I don't know, share them. Maybe that's the word. Um, or no, I mean, from uh, one repair shop to another, um, will they um, charge the charge the customer more money or for sending it back? For oh yeah, absolutely. So I'm working at my repair station. I got a wood prop that needs to be shimmed. It's out of track. I'm going to take it off. I'm going to call my favorite prop shop. I'm going to send it to them. They're going to send me a bill. I'm going to mark it up and hand it to my customer. Oh, okay, gotcha. Oh yeah, <laughs> definitely. Kevin. Uh, Somebody else had a question? Yeah. Uh, yeah. How long does it take for them to, let's say, uh, repair one? Uh, it depends on what the repair is. Uh, I don't know. You know, simple repair. I figure it's going to be gone a week. The nice thing about prop shops, uh, a lot of the prop shops, and you, I'm surprised nobody's mentioned it. You see them. They all have special trucks. They, uh, they do, well, not special trucks. They're uh, um, just your basic pickup truck, but they all have flatbeds. So it's a flatbed pickup truck. And the reason why is because these blades are sometimes, especially like a, a three blade, even for a 182, it's too big to fit in the back of a pickup bed. So they have a flatbed pickup truck that has special stakes on it. So you'll see them going down the road, the props uh, sitting there on angles so it makes it down the road. And so all the prop shops do pick up, free pickup and delivery, which is kind of nice. And since there's not many of them, they, you know, like that we use one up in Reading a lot. They make a, a trip all the way down through the valley, down through Stockton every other day or something like that. Pick up your stuff. Because props are not easy to ship around. You can't ship them UPS either. I mean, you can if it's a two blade, but not, with, not if it's a three blade. Those things are huge. Well, I shouldn't say that. You still can. It's just expensive. Uh, okay. So vibration. It's not that uncommon. It should be, but it isn't for you to finish maybe working on somebody's airplane, uh, doing an annual inspection, you had the prop off, did something and they call you up and, and uh, hey man, I got my airplane is really vibrating now. It didn't do it before, but it does it now. Some aircraft, quite a few aircraft out there, you can't even get the cowling off until you take the prop off. Prop comes off first, then the cowling comes off. So you're taking the prop off often. Uh, Cherokees are that way. And so, what do you suppose is, so if you have a sudden vibration, um, number one, a major concern, I don't even know if I, oh, I did write that, so I got that one. So most likely you have the prop out of rotation. A lot of these props are dynamically balanced and indexed. They have to go back on exactly the way they came off. The prop has to go on exactly the way it came off, the uh, bulkheads have to do, and the spinner has to. Everything is perfectly indexed. So whenever I take a prop off, you'll see that I, I have a little Sharpie or something. I will make absolute definite indica indications or tape or something where the prop has to go on. So it always goes back the same way. But customer says suddenly it vibrates. Well, yeah, we'll try rotating at 180 degrees. Rotating prop, 180 degrees. Now you have to take the prop off and rotate it. You can't rotate it while it's on the engine. That's, that's, that doesn't work. Uh, but take it off and make your, make your, because sometimes uh, it was balanced. It has balance weights on the prop and you just debalanced it by moving it, putting it on backwards. Um, 
sometimes the torque is loose and they're feeling the vibration for that. So check the prop torque, check torque. Um, and with wood props, I mentioned this, that uh, wood props, wood props uh, left with one blade down, left with one blade down may be retaining moisture, may be retaining moisture. You know what the repair is for that one? Buy a new prop. Huh. We need to put the other one down. You got it. Put the heavy side up and the light side down. Moisture will drain to the <laughs> drill drain till it's evened out. That is really the that's, what you do. That's bizarre. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so rotate, rotate at 180, make sure the problem, check torque. I should put this one, I don't have it. Uh, check index. Check the indexing, make sure it's actually installed correctly, that it's um, yeah, indexed, indexed properly to the crankshaft. Uh, repairs. Repairs. As I've told you, I don't do many repairs to propellers for a very good reason. So 14 CFR uh, 65 does not, does not allow an AMP, AMP. By the way, propellers come under the P part. That's what the P stands for, right? Um, doesn't, but it does come under the power plant side to perform to perform any major alterations or repairs. Any major alterations or repairs. Well, what is a major alteration or repair? Is it my opinion? Is it? Uh... Whatever's outlined in 14 CFR 65. Okay, uh, let me see. It says that I have a PowerPoint here. Let's see, do I really? Um, there we go. Uh, certified and certified. This is cert you're under your certification. So certified mechanic may perform supervised maintenance alteration once he's repaired, excluding major repairs to and major alterations of props and any repair or to or any alteration of instruments. So right there under 65 part 81 says you may not do any major repairs or alterations to a propeller. Great. What is a major alteration to repeller? Uh, that's something you're going to have to read. Well, where would you read it? Anybody? Anybody? There's a point that, where it that one book what major alteration and repairs are. It okay, wouldn't be in the problem manual. That's, that's only recommended. Um, it's What's that one? I can't hear. Manufacturer? Oh. manufacturer is incorrect. It's in the CFR still. Yeah, where? There's a section that actually explains what a major alteration and repair is. I don't yeah, know. Well, the book's pretty appendix, thick. Where are you going to go? Appendix A of something, I think. <laughs> Close enough. FAR 43 Appendix A. There we go. So 43 is, is maintenance. Uh, so propeller alterations, the following alteration prop. So there you go, plane change in blade design, HUD design, changes in governor, um, inst like installation of propeller governor or feathering system. Now, this, mean, this doesn't mean you can't install a prop governor. I could just see somebody saying that, that says right there you can't put a prop governor on. No, this is an alteration. So if you're installing a prop governor under an alteration, it means there wasn't one before and now there is one now. That's, that's an alteration. You can install a, a, a generator, I'm sorry, governor, but okay, here's a major repair. Any repairs to or straightening of steel blades. All right, so steel blades are kind of common, but like any repair to any, you touch a steel blade with a file, you've just repaired it. Nope, can't do it. Uh, repairing or machining of steel hubs, can't touch them. Shortening of blades, retipping of wood props, replacement of laminations, fixed pitch wood props. Uh, fixing bolt holes, let me see, repairs. This is a weird one here, repairs to comp composition blades. 
while 43 Appendix A says any repair to a composition blade, these composition companies are telling us to do it and saying, no, 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 it's just some five minute epoxy. Don't worry about it. Okay. So while it's a simple procedure, um, yeah, it just puts you in a, in, in a hard problem there. So I'm me personally, my license, if I have a repair that needs to be done to a composition blade and I call the manufacturer and they said, that's not a problem. Just put some five minute epoxy in. I'm going to say, wait a minute. That is a propeller major repair. So number one, it needs a 337, but number two, my license under part 65 said I can't do it. So I'm not doing it. It's not worth it to me. Replacement of plastic coverings, a repair of prop governors. Remember that, you can't even repair them. Um, repairs to deep dense cuts, scars, nicks, et cetera, and straightening with window blades. So those are the things you can't do. What is defined as deep? Yeah, I was just about to ask that. Whatever is defined as, I don't know. I don't act, it doesn't define it. So therein lies the problem. So I would say deep is anything that takes, um, I don't know. <laughs> I guess I'll know it when I see it. If yeah, but your your definition of not deep could be the definition of deep to the FAA. So I know, I know. I know. No, probably not. Probably it's going to be the other way around. My definition of deep is going to be so shallow that it's going to be, well, I don't know about that there, Kevin. So um, let's see. So that A, B, B. So part 65, that's what you're certified under. That is your certification, part 65. So FAR, which is the same thing as saying 14 CFR. Uh, FAR 43 appendix, appendix A lists list major alterations and repairs list major alterations alterations and repairs i worked with an ia who uh he had this funny thing and and i don't disagree with him at all so whenever we would do an annual on an aircraft that had a con that a constant speed prop and I would go to look up everything his directives on the prop. He would say, you know what? And he was the boss. So I, I just did what he did. I, he would say, I would rather you would simply write down the serial number and model number and go call the prop shop, give them that, and then ask them to research it and call you back and tell us what to do. Uh, he felt that they were just so complicated and there was so much risk involved that he didn't even want to look up everything his directives on them. I don't see that as a problem. Sometimes you have problems deciphering what's been done and what hasn't. And that's where prop shop really comes in um, handy. And I know it's almost 420. Only, only a part, FAR part. Um, this is interesting. I did this in all three ways. I did it 14 CFR, then I wrote FAR, and then I just said part. So I guess you get, get the flavoring of how FARs are wrote all in one shot there. Only a part 145 repair station. Repair station, and I should put this um, prop. I'll put it here. Prop repair station. Just because you're a repair station doesn't mean you can do this. You have to be a certified propeller repair station. Because I had a repair station or worked for one, and uh, we were not a repair station for props, so it means we couldn't do it. So um, can perform. Can perform. Major alterations and repairs. What 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 was your shop a repair station for? Like, or considered like you're talking about a prop repair station? What were you guys under? Airframe and engine. So does that mean you being an A and P, you couldn't pull your engine on your 150 and rebuild it? It would have to go to a repair station. No, no. As an A and P, I can do it. And our shop was for 50 some years was not a repair station. And so, and it ran an engine, it did all the same work pretty much. Not, the work didn't really change at all once it became a repair station. They came in and looked at what we were doing and said, okay, well, we'll make your repair station do all this stuff you're doing. And that's what we did. Oh, so that's like almost being like accredited. Yeah. It's exactly, I like that. I never used the word, but yeah, it's like being in an accredited place. I'm going to stop the recording here.